All right. Today is Monday, April 11th, and this is a recap of the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but ooh, what a bloodbath we got in the stock market today. Pain across the board. We're going to talk about that and a lot more in tonight's program. And here it is in focus tonight. Inflation and the stock market. And no, it's not a rom-com kind of relationship. It's more like a dark thriller. It starts as romance. You know, inflation, the guy is tall, dark, and handsome. And by the end of the movie, he's chasing her around the house with a chainsaw. It's that kind of relationship. And uh, we're already at the chasing you around the house with a chainsaw part of the movie. Why? Because the stock market, the NASDAQ in this case, lost one trillion dollars. Yep, one trillion dollars last week alone and today we're adding more to the pain why because today the big cap technology names fell apart they took down the spy and the nasdaq down with them we also have another bomb coming which is the russian default now we know that russia has a lot of cash overseas but the u.s government and its allies are forcing the default because foreign Russian assets in U.S. and European banks, be it dollars or euros, all of these assets are frozen. So it is just a matter of time now before Russia defaults. And of course, Russia is going to sue back, and it goes back and forth. But the moral of the story is, we have another bomb coming. If Russia defaults, we're going to have ripple impacts across global economies and global markets. So we could see another leg down in the stock market coming. But it's not just me saying that. Listen to Bank of America, for example. Bank of America says the S&P 500 will plunge 11% by the end of 2022 as inflation shock sparks a recession. Yep, the R word. It's coming out more often as of late, right? Recession shock. Bank of America is the latest major institution to deliver a grim warning for the future. So we had douchebag. Now we have Bank of America saying it's going to be a recession. And mind you, Larry Summers predicted that. Larry Summers said the majority of economists, just a matter of time, they're going to come down to the conclusion that this economy will dip into a recession one hundred percent. It's in the bag now. Not your job. Your job is not in the bag. Recession is in the bag. But rest assured, perhaps we have a glimpse of hope in the equities market because remember a professional pumper from JP Morgan Chase, Marko Kukulovic? What a stupid son of a bitch. Well, he's now capitulating and folding already. Marko Kukulovic says that you should take profits now from U.S. equities and add to emerging markets. Is it time to buy the dip now that Marko Kukulovic waved the white flag perhaps we should wait for tom lee right but the question is where do you go if you take uh, your cash if you hit the cha-ching button on u.s equities what do you do with the cash well according to marco he says go to emerging markets but goldman sachs says you gotta buy the dip in uk stocks Really? I wouldn't even do that with your money, let alone mine. But look at the year-to-date performances of the sectors in the U.S. stock market. Number one by far, energy at 43.3%. At number two, utilities at 7.5%. At number three, staples at around 2.3%. And then healthcare, big pharma, at around 1.3%. The rest, they're all down. And the losses are led by information technology and communication services. Not a good formation, folks. This is the kind of formation that we saw back in 2000 and 2007, right before the crashes. It is always not a good sign when energy leads the pack, number one. It is not a good sign when utilities outperform, number two. Number three, it's not a good sign when information technology lags. And this is exactly what we're seeing right now. As if the market is saying, it's going to be a bad year. And by the way, next year it's going to be even worse. But rest assured, we have some hope here. When we talk about dump the U.S., move somewhere else, J.P. Morgan Chase says emerging markets, Goldman Sachs says U.K. and European equities, Credit Suisse says Venezuela. Yep, the world might be falling apart, but Venezuela is set to grow 20% this year. So pack your bags and let's go down to Venezuela. I guess it was part of the Biden agenda to make Venezuela great again, right? Anyways, we have the Fed now also warning that um, the margin of error should make you shit your pants. Because now we have Governor Waller from the Fed, Christopher Waller, who came out today and said that the Fed is doing all it can to avoid collateral damage, quote-unquote. You are the collateral damage, you dummies, you bums. You poor, mid-class, 
You're the collateral damage. But our sponsors, the rich, the 1%, the corporate insiders, oh, they're swimming in cash. Waller says he's doing all he can to avoid collateral damage from raising interest rates. A brute force tool, quote unquote, that can act as a hammer on the economy. This guy's graphic. What is he, a serial killer? I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, after all, he works for the Fed, an organization full of psychos. But anyways, remember that Bullard said 3.5% by the end of the year in the brute force tool, right? That's going to smash your head. He says 3.5%. Goldman Sachs says bullshit. It's not going to be 3.5%. It's going to be more like 4% plus. Uh-oh. We're talking about a lot of pain here. But rest assured, if you're bullish the stock market, if you think we're going to go back to the moon, you got allies. And these allies come from BlackRock. Yep, U.S. recession is not imminent, despite the yield curve inversion, BlackRock executive says. So rest assured, BlackRock got you. Don't sell, don't panic, don't scream. What recession? What recession? I mean, look at us. We're at mansions, private jets, super yachts. Business is good. Please don't sell. And speaking of the BlackRock administration, today we got Brian Deese once again. He came out, and this administration, by the way, is nasty. I mean, they're the kings of propaganda. They're doing the same with the Russia-Ukraine war. They come out ahead of time with the conspiracy theories, and they say, oh, we have to be ahead of the Russians. And they do the same thing, by the way, on the economic front. So we know we got the CPI tomorrow, and it could be a shock. It could be 9%. It could be 9.5%. So what does the BlackRock administration do? They send Brian Deese out to tamper down the expectations. And Brian Deese says, we're expecting a high CPI tomorrow. It's going to be elevated. And these are all mind games to prevent the stock market from crashing. Because the consensus right now is 8.5%. If we get anything more than 8.5%, the stock market will crash instantly. But if we get 8.4, 8.3, and the cooks are going to do their best, by the way, to mask inflation. If the cooks at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the kitchen, if they give us 8.4%, 8.2%, the stock market will move higher like a rocket ship instantly. Why? Because it is a game of expectations. And Brian Deese from the BlackRock administration came out today and set the background for these expectations. But here's the problem, folks. You can play all kind of games you want, but you cannot mask the facts. And the facts say inflation is going to move higher and higher and higher. Number one, look at jet fuel, for example. The supply is nowhere to be found. Jet fuel costs to the moon and this week we're about to get the earnings from delta we will see the true picture of the airlines industry for now when these airline companies pay more for jet fuel who do you think they're passing that extra cost down to the answer is you and i the consumer how long can they continue to do that well if the consumer is flush with cash and they have jobs and stimmies all over the place no problem but if the consumer is cutting down on unnecessary spending such as traveling because they have to spend more on gas, rent, utilities, food, groceries, then they're not going to be able to pass that extra cost anymore. They're going to have to eat the loss. They're going to have to hold the bag. And this is when the economy starts to fall apart. When the ability of companies to pass that extra cost, to pass that inflation cost down to us, when they're not capable to do that anymore, the economy falls apart, either in stagflation or a recession. But the bottom line is, when it comes to the CPI tomorrow, we know that airline fares will go higher. No doubt about it. What else? When we talk about trucking, for example, the costs for salaries and wages for these truckers, and we talked about Walmart's wages, 110000 minimum. So we have wage inflation in trucking. We also have fuel costs, diesel costs to the moon. Who do you think they're going to pass that extra cost down to? The answer is you and I, baby, we're going to pay for everything. So we know that the cost of trucking is going higher, which means the cost of food, the cost of goods, the cost of furniture, the cost of everything we consume will go higher. And now, inflation expectations, the median one year ahead, according to the New York Fed, these expectations are moving higher and higher and higher. So the consumer says, uh -uh -uh, we're not buying this bullshit anymore. We think one year from now, inflation will still be at around 6 to 7%. What does that mean? It means that the public does not trust the Fed. It means that the Fed has to be more aggressive to tamper down these inflation expectations. And if the Fed is going to be more aggressive with the hammer and the brunt force tool, what do you think will happen to the equities market? What do you think will happen to the economy? What do you think is going to happen to your job? What do you think is going to happen to your house and mortgage? Yep. 
It's time to start thinking about all of these things right now. And look at this. The Fed back in January said that inflation expectations are stable. Nothing to see here, right? The house behind me is not burning. You're just imagining all of that. And by the way, these fast price rises, they're easing. Well, we now know that inflation expectations are moving higher and higher and higher. Prices are moving higher and higher and higher. So what is the Fed going to say right now? They're going to say, oh, back in January, we did not know that Putin is going to invade Ukraine. It's all about the war. Inflation was supposed to be transitory. But then came Putin again. Are we a bunch of children? stupid zombies to believe that maybe we got a poll today where the public the american public is blaming putin for the price hikes at the pump so the moral of the story is never underestimate the stupidity of the american public i would say around 30 percent are now zombified completely brainless completely part of the sheep and the other 20 percent hooked up on drugs, all of these pills that they gobble up every single day like a bunch of M&Ms, and then you have the rest of them, 50%, who have some degree of sanity left. Anyhow, when we talk about inflation expectations, look at this. Rent to the moon, and they say 10%, really? Have you looked at rents at Phoenix, Arizona, San Diego, California, Las Vegas, Nevada, Seattle, Washington? What 10%? Are you insane? We're talking about over 100% increases in rents. But anyways, we have gas at 10%, food over 10%, medical care still over 10%. College education moving higher and higher and higher. Look at this. Gold. Yep. Gold. Inflation is moving higher. Something to keep in mind. And remember when we talked about the inflation of goods versus the inflation of services, and in a healthy inflation, you want to see the inflation in services surpassing the inflation in goods, because it means that the consumer is healthy, they're going out to eat, they're traveling more, they're partying more, etc., etc. But in a bad inflation, the consumer is busy spending on goods because they're chasing that inflation of gas, groceries, utility bills, etc., etc. Well, I got some good news for you. Yep, let's celebrate already. Bring out the champagne and let's have a party because inflation in services is moving higher. Yep, but here's the problem. It is not moving higher because people are going out to eat and traveling more. It's going higher due to rent inflation. Not a good sign. And you look at the consumer sentiment worldwide, it's in the toilet. Not just in the US, in Canada, in Brazil, in the Middle East, in China, in Russia, in Europe, all over the place. Because inflation is a global phenomenon now, and people don't like inflation. We talked about the Pakistan story yesterday. We talked about Sri Lanka. We talked about Peru. And more and more countries are seeing uprising of protests because inflation continues to move higher and higher and higher. Even in Japan, by the way, the king of deflation, inflation expectations in Japan, are moving higher. This is the first time we've seen this phenomenon since 2007. Matter of fact, the Japanese household is now spending less. The Japanese are ahead of the game. When they have inflation, they tighten up their budgets. They don't go like a bunch of morons swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down like us. And hence, they have deflation, not inflation. But right now, even Japan is about to have stagflation. Inflation expectations moving higher, consumer spending moving down. And there is no relief in sight, folks. A lot of mistakes been done. It's not just the thing, lockdowns, and you're seeing the draconian scenes in Shanghai for example. It's not just the mismanagement of the war by issuing all of these stupid sanctions. It's not just the Fed's mistake of unleashing the tsunami of liquidity and increasing the money supply to an insane level, which got us inflation, by the way. But it's also the EV mania, the EV lunacy, because they've convinced all of these auto manufacturers since the Biden administration took office, well, they convinced all of these auto manufacturers that you should be producing more EVs because there is no money in the old school gas combustion engine. The government will give you more assistance, more credit, more PR, if you switch your assembly lines to EVs instead of traditional cars. And immediately we saw the American manufacturers, Ford, GM, and the rest of them, switching their assembly lines from regular cars to EVs, abandoning the production of regular cars in favor of EVs. Well, here's the problem. The European manufacturers did the same thing. Japanese manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers. Why? Because the stock market decided to reward these EV manufacturers. Look at the stock of Ford, for example. GM, dead money for years. The moment they said EV, the stock shot up higher. Whether they actually have EVs or not, that's a different story. But the focus of management has shifted, and they went all in, all of their bets, in one basket. And this basket is the EV lunacy. Well, guess what? There is one problem. To have EVs, you need a lot of materials. You need chips, 
you need aluminum, you need zinc, and most importantly, you need batteries. And these batteries need lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel, and many other resources. Well, guess what happens when you have all of these EV manufacturers competing for the business of battery manufacturers? Well, the battery manufacturers now have to secure more lithium, more cobalt, more nickel, and many other resources. But the main one is lithium. What is the infrastructure of lithium? looks like globally. We have some production in Australia, in Canada, in Chile, in many other countries, but the supply cannot keep up with the insane level and the sudden, most importantly, sudden, that's the key word, sudden surge in demand. It will take years for the miners to develop the supply needed for that insane surge in demand. In the meantime, we have a massive shortage of cars and the prices of lithium due to the scarcity are moving higher and higher and higher. And now we have another problem. Even if the manufacturers can't secure lithium for the batteries, they're gonna have to pay an arm and a leg for it. So even if these EVs are actually manufactured, it will be way out of the reach of the consumer. Too expensive. 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars as an average price. And this is the EV trap. We now know lithium is nowhere to be found and the prices are moving higher and higher and higher. On top of that, today BMW CEO came out and said expect the chip shortage to last all the way to 2023. And when the BMW CEO says 2023, make that 2024. So what's going to happen now? All of these manufacturers are going to have uh, EVs with no batteries. You got to drive them by your feet like the Flintstones, right? That's green energy for you, feet. And then when your feet gets dirty after driving for so long, you can sell those dirty feet pictures on OnlyFans and make millions. Boom. See how smart we are? Problem solved. Who needs EVs anymore? Anyways, inflation is a problem across the globe. Look at north of the border. The country we call Canada, for example. If you thought we have a housing problem here, an affordability crisis for housing here, think again. Because in Canada, it's even worse. Much worse. And the Canadian consumer is starting to feel the pain now. Canadians are cutting back on groceries due to inflation according to a survey. The survey of 1,514 Canadians found that a majority, 60%, say the cost of groceries is rising by so much that they are having to cut back to essential goods only. Those living in the Atlantic Canada are most likely to scale back grocery purchases to necessities, 71%, followed by Manitoba and Saskatchewan eh? at 69%, Alberta at 64%, Ontario at 61%, British Columbia 56%, and Quebec at 52%. And this is, by the way, happening in a first world country, a Western country with a lot of money. What do you think is happening in Africa, Middle East, South America, India? South Asia. That is not the only way Canadians are adapting to food inflation. The Yahoo Morrow Public Opinion Survey found that over half of Canadians, 52%, say that they're buying less food because of rising costs. Another 51% say they're choosing to buy groceries at discount chains. Pay attention now. Let's say energy stocks go down, fertilizer stocks go down, we head into a recession. Which stocks are going to outperform? The answer is tobacco stocks, alcohol stocks, and discount store stocks. Anyways, while 56% say they're cutting back on purchases of red meat because of high price, another 49% say they search for expiration date discounts on meat products to save on costs. Wow. The survey found that lower income households making less than $50,000 a year the middle income households, making between fifty dollars and $100,000, are the most likely to change their food shopping habits in the wake of inflation. Surprise, surprise, inflation hurts the poor and the middle class the most. Many Canadians did everything they could to survive the, to survive the harshest days of the pandemic, only to emerge into a new world where the choice is now between half a tank of gas to get to work in the morning or half a shopping cart to fill their family's stomach in the evening. Wow. And by the way, this is a country that is rich in oil and rich in food. Canada. Why are we seeing this insane inflation? For all of you, by the way, who say it's a supply problem. Well, Canada has an abundant supply of oil and food. Why are they facing this inflation? The answer is because inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon.
meaning the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the world, prints a lot of cocaine, yeah, yo, all over the place, trillions and trillions of dollars, well, you're going to get inflation. It doesn't matter whether you have oil or not. It doesn't matter whether you have wheat or not. It doesn't matter whether you have lumber or not. The prices of these commodities are moving higher, and you have to buy them at the market price. And this is how the trading system works, whether we like it or not. But rest assured, for all of you bum Canadians who are cutting down on food and shopping and all of that, well, we got an American professional here who says to Americans of course but I'm sure it can be applicable to Canadians too when she says we should start eating lentils and let our pets die to cope with inflation yep she says you need to earn more than three hundred thousand dollars otherwise good luck and by good luck we mean take the bus don't buy in bulk try lentils instead of meat and nobody said this would be fun oh yeah and that part where you should put your pet down because they cost a lot of money these animals who needs them anyways well guess what the prices of lentils to the moon so the whole thing about skip red meat and eat lentils instead not gonna work anymore everything is moving higher and why we must ask the question why? What was the real cause for this inflation? Well, we know it was due to the Fed's policy mistake of flooding the system with unneeded liquidity. We're talking about trillions of dollars. But the main question is why? Why did they do that? The answer is once again to prop up the stock and real estate markets. God forbid the rich start to lose money. This was the entire reason behind the Fed's cocaine operation which gave us inflation and which will give us a global recession, perhaps a depression and massive political unrest across the globe. Isn't it time for the pitchforks to come out and hold the Fed responsible for what they did? I certainly think so. But you think the media is talking about this? Of course not. Your average American doesn't even know what the Fed is, let alone blame them for inflation. And hence, they're blaming the administration, they're blaming Putin, they're blaming Jupiter and Uranus for inflation, but not the Fed. And this is done by design to protect this racket. Because without the Fed, we will not have income inequality. We will not have the oligarchy. We will not have the irrational stock market that continues to move higher and higher and higher, making the rich richer and richer and richer. Anyways, we got to wrap it up here before uh, they start banning this channel. And we got to move on to the stock market coverage. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average was down by 413.4 points or a decline of 1.19%. The Nasdaq down 299.4 points or a decline of 2.18%. The S&P 500 down by 75.75 .75 points or a decline of 1.69%. What about the sector's performances today? Shame on all of them. Every single sector of the stock market was down today in the red and the losses were led by energy, technology and communication services. No metals at all. What about the advance to decline ratios? NYSE, 34% advancing versus 62% declining. The NASDAQ, 29% advancing versus 66% declining. Moving on to commodities, it was obvious the divergence between Brent and the WTI. Brent closed barely in the green, yet below 100, an important psychological line. On the other hand, the WTI was down over 3% today. Likewise, gasoline was down almost 3.5%. Heating oil was down almost 1%, but the winner continues to be natural gas, gaining over 6.5% today alone. And by the way, OPEC, when we talk about the dynamics for oil, bullish or bearish, when it comes to the supply, the dynamic remains bullish for oil. The demand is a different story because of the lockdowns in Shanghai. But when it comes to the supply, OPEC tells the EU it is not possible to replace Russian oil. In other words, OPEC says to the Europeans, you want to cut Russian oil, good luck because we cannot substitute for the supply of Russian oil. It is not possible. We're talking about over 5 million barrels per day. What about softs? Lumber is the story here. The volatility in lumber is absolutely insane. Lumber was up big on Friday, now it's down big, almost 7.5% today alone. Likewise, we have losses for cocoa, a little under half a percentage point, and sugar was down also by around half a percent. Yet we have gains led by OJ. OJ remains the winner, an impressive variety for OJ by the way, adding another 3.5% or so today alone. Likewise, we have gains for cotton, almost 2.25% today, and coffee. We talked about the bullish setup for coffee not so long ago, and now coffee's adding almost 2.5% gains today. What about metals? Well, gold and silver are in the green. Gold scoring almost half a percentage point today. Silver, almost 1 and 3 quarters percent gains today. We also have gains 
for platinum, palladium. We're going to talk about palladium in a minute, but copper was down almost one and a half percent today. What is the story with palladium, by the way? Because palladium was up almost nine percent in Friday's session alone. Number one, we have a shortage of supply. Number two, we have more stupidity, a suspension of trading of palladium in the Chicago and London exchanges to punish two Russian suppliers, major suppliers, I should add. Prices of palladium and rhodium are poised to rally for years as a supply squeeze tightens for the metals that are key to curbing vehicle emissions, said the head of the world's largest producer of platinum. Prices of palladium and rhodium that are used in catalytic converters have risen more than 30% this year alone. The lack of major investment in new supply may help support the rally, said Nico Muller, the chief executive officer at Impala Platinum Holdings. We are in a different structural environment at the moment, Muller said in an interview at his office in Johannesburg on Thursday. I believe I believe that the fundamental market dynamics are going to provide strong price support for our metals for at least the next four to five years, potentially even longer. Wow. And here is the suspension thing. On Friday, the London Platinum and Palladium market suspended Crest's Vestment and Priorsky plant non-ferrous metals from its good delivery and sponge accreditation lists. That was a lot to go through. Anyways. The LPPM's announcement reverses its decision a month ago to continue letting the Russian plants supply precious metals to the trading hub. The CME then suspended the approved status of warranting and delivery of certain platinum and palladium brands from the two refiners until further notice. These two exchanges represent large trading markets for platinum and palladium. The two refiners are material suppliers to these exchanges. And this is according to Christopher Nicholson from Morgan Stanley, who also expects near-term impacts on spot market liquidity. Meanwhile, the Japan Exchange Group said the Osaka Exchange is considering revoking Russia's good delivery designation for platinum and palladium brands in its future market following the LPPM's move. More stupidity to come. What does that mean? Palladium prices will go higher and higher and higher. If the designation is cancelled, it is expected that open interest in the contracts will decrease sharply and liquidity will decline for some time, it said. Palladium supply was already under significant pressure as a result of strong vehicle sector demand and inventory concerns related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, said Gavin Wint who's a big shot of some place, I don't know. But here's the important part. The latest suspension of Russian refiner output will further exacerbate market concerns and fuel even more price upside. And as palladium prices move higher, semiconductor stocks move down. Back to the futures, what about meats? Stable across the board, feeder cattle, lean hogs, live cattle futures, no major moves whatsoever. But lean hogs was in the red, feeder and live cattle futures in the green. Lastly, what about grains? Well, wheat, the most important commodity to watch here, was up almost two and three quarters percent today, yet we have losses across the board for corn, rough rice, soybean meal, soybean oil, soybeans, all down, with the exception of oats, oats closing the day in the green, and by the way, oats at all time highs, yep, we predicted that in this channel a long time ago, when I shared with you this. Oat production in the United States is the lowest since 1866. Yep, this is not an error. It's not a typo. 1866. Are we about to have a famine or what? And by the way, when we talk about corn, a lot of corn comes out of Ukraine. The European supply comes out of Ukraine. Well, guess what? The corn is here. Ukrainian farmers produce the corn, but they cannot ship them anywhere. Number one, there is a war. The ports are clogged. You cannot really ship corn out of the country, even if you wanted to. Number two, they have to prioritize both corn and wheat for domestic consumption. So we know we're going to have a massive shortage of corn and corn prices will move higher. Moving on to options, the big casino. The volume is down all in all. A bad sign for the bulls. But regardless, at number one, Apple, with around 850,000 contracts traded today, about 58% of those were calls. At number two, Tesla, the souffle, at around 650,000 contracts traded today, about 57% of those were calls. At number three, AMD, at around 550,000 contracts traded today, about 62% of those were calls. And notice the name at the bottom of the table, the ticker VERU. The name almost tripled today. It was up almost 200%. This is a company that makes female condoms. Yep, don't laugh. They actually exist. 
So why did the stock surge higher today? The answer is because they announced a treatment for the thing. Maybe putting some of those female condoms right in your mouth that blocks the thing. I don't know. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker T for AT&T. Bucking the trend and closing in the green today. But we've seen these pops in AT&T upgrades, follow through, and then the rally fades away. So I'm taking it with a grain of salt. But somebody's buying calls in this case the 24 calls for the expiration date april 14th meaning this upcoming friday with expectations that at&t could rally higher by more than 22 percent by then they paid around one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two and a half million dollars and what about the trade for the ticker mos mosaic a name that we like in this channel but somebody's buying puts perhaps we will see a pullback here they bought the 66 puts for the expiration date this upcoming friday or i should say thursday because there is no friday we're not trading on friday so it is april 14th with the expectations that the name could move down by more than 11 percent by then they paid around 20 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around two hundred thousand dollars what about the ticker a mat for applied materials chips they're buying puts here not a good sign the 95 puts for the expiration date may 13th with the expectations that the name could go down by more than 18 percent by then they paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars and what about the ticker apd this is for a company called Air Product and Chemicals. In this case, they're buying calls, the 270 calls for the expiration date, June 17th, with the expectations that the name could move higher by more than 8% by then. They paid around four bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around three and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker nvo novo nordisk all of these big pharma names are at the farming year to date and this name is pretty much at all time highs and somebody's bidding for more gains to come by buying the 130 calls for the expiration date may 20th with the expectations the name could move higher by more than seven and a half percent by then they paid around two bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one and a half million dollars what about the ticker xbi for the biotech etf a decent rally as of late but it pulled back and somebody's bidding for more pain to come by buying the 82 puts for the expiration date april 22nd with expectations that the name could move down by more than six percent by then they paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around six hundred thousand dollars continuing with interesting trades what about the trades for the ticker axp this is for amex american express it is a put spread they're buying the 160 puts and they're selling the 145 all for the expiration date may 20th with expectations that axp could go down by more than eight excuse me more than 10 percent but not more than 18 percent by then and they paid around three bucks a piece for the 160 puts and they received around one buck and 30 cents a piece for selling the 145 puts all in all the entry cost is down at 1.7 meaning one buck and 70 cents a piece all in all bringing the total at around seven hundred thousand dollars and lastly what about the trade for the ticker shop shopify we have news for the name we're going to cover in a minute but they're buying calls here the 650 calls for the expiration date april 14th meaning this upcoming thursday not friday with the expectations that shopify could move higher by more than five percent by then they paid around nine bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around three million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis a bloodbath across the board very few exceptions in financials for example in the automobile manufacturers in airlines and i believe that the majority of the green activities that we got today is short covering ahead of earnings why would airlines move higher and the rest of the market is down somebody's covering before delta's earnings and the same goes for financials but we have a lot of pain this time around even energy's down big even big pharma's down big abv is down over two percent we talked about that name in yesterday's video the credit card companies are down big but most importantly the big cap technology names were down big and that tells me all of that dip buying they're finally giving up 
They're waving the white flag and saying, I don't think it's going to happen. Book whatever profits, whatever losses you have and say goodbye. Why? Because we have the CPI tomorrow. And if there is a shock, nobody wants to assume the risk. But that also opens the door for an unexpected reaction by the stock market. If the CPI comes at around 8%, 8.2%, 7.9%, anything under 8.5%, we could see a rally here because we're seeing some capitulation. It's not enough to wash out the mania, but it is enough for now. If certain things happen, such as a tame reading of the CPI, but you also have to bear in mind what happens if Russia defaults, let's say by tomorrow, we're going to see a lot of pain in the market. It's just the way it is, risk versus reward. Let's talk about some of the notable movers that we got today. Shopify bucked the trend and closed in the green by almost 2% today. Why did that happen? Another stock split 10 for 1, which is stupid by the way. I mean, at this stage, if your only tool to prop up the stock higher is a stock split, you got bigger problems here. And by the way, this will benefit the CEO and the management, not the shareholders. Toxic garbage, stay away. We also have news for Netflix, which is down big today. And it is down over 50% from the highs. But rest assured, the CEO and the co-CEO, Hastings and Sarandos, well, they're taken care of. They're not going to lose anything here. Their pay package, $41 million for Hastings and $38 million for Sarandos. This is the racket that we call the stock market. The insiders never lose. They cash in millions of dollars in salaries and billions of dollars when they dump stock. And the public, the lottery ticket chasers end up paying the price. We also have uh, good news for Pfizer, even though the name was down. Cases of the thing rising higher, and we now have Taiwan ordering a bunch of Pfizer pills to combat the thing, I guess. What about Neo? Neo was down big in the morning, over 11%. But believe it or not, they bought the dip in Neo, and at some point, Neo was actually trading in the green, a reversal of more than 11%. We have supply chain disruptions, the shutdown in Shanghai. Why did people buy the dip? I have have no clue at all. And then we have bad news for Alibaba because it appears that Charlie Munger is also capitulating and cutting his stake in Alibaba by 50%. Even Charlie Munger is holding the bag. And lastly, what about Etsy? Let's zoom in on the heat map here. Etsy barely in the green, but it was a wild ride, just like Neo. Etsy was down big, then it closed in the green. Why? Because we have bad news for Etsy. Over 14,000 sellers are now going on strike to protest the new transaction fees. Etsy's hiking those fees higher and higher and higher, and now we have a backlash. Whether it's big or not, doesn't matter, but it is a sign that this company is desperate for revenue, desperate for profits, and it's not a good sign ahead of earnings. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs, a bloodbath across the board, specifically for chips, the SOXX, SMH, biotech was down big, XPI, and even oil and energy were down big. Look at the XLE, down over 3%, XOP, OIH, all damn big. What's working today? Some rebounds, which we cannot take seriously, at least right now, because we don't have any confirmation. For example, the XHB for home builders was in the green, even though rates are moving higher. So is it a leading indicator that the 10-year yield is about to cool down and therefore home builders are rebounding? Too early to say. It will all depend on the reaction of the 10-year yield right after we get the CPI. And by the way, look at the TQQs, all these leverage indices that you people like to buy. The TQQs down 7% today alone. I'm sure the geniuses who bought the dip via buying the TQQs are very glad right now because the TQQs is down over 40% this year alone. Unbelievable. We talk about the contrast between growth and value both in the red, yet value is outperforming growth. Likewise, when we talk about international markets, for example, all in the red, but I still like the EWZ Brazil, I still like Canada, I still like Australia, I still like Saudi Arabia, the ticker KSA, I still like Indonesia, the ticker ENDO. We have good news for the Indonesian market, by the way. It remains hot. For example, the largest tech company in Indonesia go to, the IPO of that company scored over 20% gains right off the bat. When you have a market with hot IPOs, then this market is still in bullish territory. We're seeing this in Indonesian equities. We're seeing this in Middle Eastern equities, specifically Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So when uh, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs say take profits from US equities and rotate maybe to international markets, which one do you pick? They like the EEM, but that includes China. So I like to pick individual 
international markets, in this case, be it Brazil, be it Canada, be it Australia, be it Indonesia, rather than buying the good, the bad, and the ugly all together. Moving on to charts, and we start with the SPY, the S&P 500. This is a 30 minutes chart. It was a bad day right off the bat, a gap down at what? 443, an important line. And the chart did not give up easily. It consolidated at around 443 for the majority of the day in a bear flag pattern and then came the flush down at the last hour of the day. Not a good sign when the stock market closes at the lows of the day, but we have a lot of macro movers, specifically the CPI in tomorrow's activities, so that could move the market one way or the other. However, from a technical standpoint alone, we cannot just rely on the CPI because for now, the chart says it wants to go down a retest for 38 is support and then take it from there. And that could happen, by the way, in the pre-market, for example, and then the CPI comes out pleasant and we see the futures moving higher. But the behavior of the chart today says it is looking for support. It did not find support at 443, so it needs to go down to 438. Whether it does that during the regular hours or in the pre-market, that's a different story but it has to catch support below 443, and the number I have is 438. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500? Again, the line here is 4,384 and a half. You gotta retest that, at least in the pre-market. The SPY has to go down there and recheck for support. If it holds, so far, so good. Now we wait for the CPI. If the CPI, the cooks, give us a good reading, then we see a rebound from 4,384 and a half. If not, the chart flushes down and the target becomes 4,232. We look at the momentum indicators, they're negative across the board, the RSI, the MACD indicators, all in negative divergences. Not a good sign for the bulls, but they have to hang their hats at around 4,384 and a half. Because what the bulls are ultimately hoping for is a reverse head and shoulder formation. We saw the left shoulder, the right shoulder, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter to me. We saw the head, and we're now waiting for the other shoulder to form. That could happen with a bounce from 4,384 and a half. That could happen even if the chart goes down all the way to 4,232. So SPY bulls have a lot of room for maneuver here. You cannot call it dead until and unless 4,232 is lost to support. Because if the chart goes all the way down there, it's a lot of pain, but who's to say that we're not going to see the formation of the reverse head and shoulder? What about the SPX, the cash index? Not a good look. Lost the 200 days moving average for good. We have a negative divergence on the RSI and the MACD indicators, and the volume is rising higher on down days. Could the chart rebound higher from a reverse head and shoulder formation, let's say at around 4,300? It is possible, but the consensus for now is for the SPX to go down to 4,000, retest that as support, and then we could see a lot of institutional buying if we see a rebound from 4,000, but most importantly, we see the fundamentals changing, be it inflation cooling down, be it the Fed not having to be too aggressive, for example. From a technical standpoint alone, you wait for the reverse head and shoulder. If that doesn't happen, then 4,000 will be the next stop. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart for the NASDAQ. Again, it was ugly from the get-go. A gap down on what? 343, an important support. And it was a battle back and forth, back and forth throughout the day. But the Bulls eventually lost 343 as support. This is not a good sign for them but it is an encouraging sign for the bears. The bears are fighting back and they want to get the chart all the way down to 343, perhaps if that fails all the way down to 316 and a half, but we'll take it one step at a time. For the bulls to have any hope, they need to reclaim 343 as support. Can they do that in tomorrow's session, for example? It is possible, folks, because we got to get the CPI out of the way and then we have a shortened trading week. So the majority of traders for now are going to be at the desk until we get the CPI and let's say by by lunchtime in tomorrow's session, the majority will bail out for the entirety of the week. Gone. That leaves the door open for the bulls to stage a rally. So let's say we have a shock after the CPI and the queues go down all the way to 334. For example, at this point, if that happens, the RSI will be extremely oversold from a 30 minutes perspective 
and even an hourly perspective. And if that happens, folks, I will be buying the dip with both hands on the queues. As a trade, of course. I already have my puts. I would close them at around 3.34. I would buy some calls as a rebound all the way till the end of the week. I'm not saying this will be the bottom, but in a shortened trading week, the path of least resistance is higher. So if the chart of the queues goes down to 3.34, number one, you get an oversold reading. Number two, you get a good entry point for a rebound rally, perhaps all the way to 343 once again. Who knows what's going to happen, but this is one scenario to keep in mind. And here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the queues. Not a good look, folks, because the volume is rising higher on down days. The momentum indicators are now firmly in the red, in negative divergences on both, the RSI and the MACD, and the bulls are about to lose 14,000, the most critical support. They get a bounce from 14,000. I could be open-minded and say maybe they can rebound from 13,800, for example, but that gotta happen by tomorrow, lunchtime. If it doesn't happen, goodbye. Why do I say that, by the way? Because just like the SPY's bulls, the Q's bulls are hoping for a reverse head and shoulder formation. But if they lose 14,000, the reverse head and shoulder formation hopes are poof, gone. Not gonna happen. So 14,000 is a must hold support for the NASDAQ bulls. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000 30 minutes chart? Look at that. It bounced over and over and over again from 196 and a half. This means that the chart is knocking at 196 and a half. Is it a good support? Is it a good support? And it's asking over and over and over again. If it gets a rebound from 196 and a half, then you know this is a good support and the shorts have to cover, and the bulls might want to buy the IWM here all the way for a ratty to 204 and a half. But if 196 and a half doesn't hold, then the other scenario is taking place, which is knocking over and over and over at the support, and at some point it gives up, and we see a flush down. If that happens, we have a gap to fill at around, let's say, 195. If that doesn't hold, then the chart will go down all the way to 191 and a half for support. What about the Dixie? So far, so good. It is holding at around 99.9. .9. It is not giving up yet, but that all depends on the reading of the CPI tomorrow, because if it is tame, if the market decides it is tame, and we see the 10-year yield moving down, so will the US dollar, and this will be good for gold. Gold is already moving higher, but it is waiting and waiting and waiting for a green light to launch another rally higher, perhaps an impulsive rally higher. It all depends on the US dollar going down, topping, and then the US 10-year yield also topping and moving down. The CPI could be the catalyst for that, or it could be the next shoe to drop. And therefore, we're seeing the sell-off, the de-risking that took place in the equities market today. What about the 10-year yield? Here's a daily chart. You cannot play the technicals on this one. It has been overextended for a while. It has not been respecting any resistance lines, carving its way through these resistance lines like knife through butter. So it's all about the fundamentals here. If the CPI comes out tame, and by tame we mean below 8.5%, and we could see a top in this chart, and that would be good for gold and good for the TLT. Here's a weekly chart for the TLT. Again, the technicals don't matter anymore because they lost the support, the most important support of 128. We're now waiting for the fundamental rebound. Could it happen? Yes, it could if we have a tame reading of the CPI. But if we have a hot reading, watch out. We could see the flush down continuing and perhaps the 10-year reaching 3% by tomorrow. Here is the VIX, a four hours chart. The VIX is accelerating its way to the upside. We're seeing the bull flag playing out. It is facing some resistance at around 24.29. But the RSI, the MACD indicators, all pointing out for more gains for the VIX. Similar story with the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ. Stack, the bull flags playing out and the momentum indicators are also pointing out for more gains to come, meaning more pain for the NASDAQ. And here's Apple, the king of the NASDAQ, not a good look. It lost the support of 172.4 and now today it lost the support of the upper range of the channel. The next support will be down at 157. We have negative divergences on both the RSI and the MACD indicator. If Apple goes down, you think the Qs will hold? Of course not. And on top of that, even Microsoft was down today. And guess who called the top in Microsoft just a few months ago? Yep, once again, the guy you're listening to right now. Here's another one, Microsoft, way overbought. So we know that Microsoft was pretty much chiefly behind the rally in the Qs, along with Apple, Tesla, and Facebook. 
And every time, and this might be really hard to read, I know that, but look at the RSI. This is an hourly chart. Every time we had overextended readings to the upside, the chart from Microsoft pulled down. And the pull down ranged from 2% all the way to almost 9%. The question is, how far will the upcoming pullback take us? And here's the answer. Since then, Microsoft went down by 21.5%. So I saved you a loss of almost 21% had you listened to me, and maybe a gain of over 21.5% if you shorted the name. But here's the problem with Microsoft. This is a weekly chart, by the way. There was a channel, a bullish channel, with higher highs and higher lows. And the channel broke to the upside. It was a bullish breakout. It went down to retest the upper range of the channel, and we got a rebound. This is, by the way, typical charting behavior. You break above the bullish channel, you have to go down to retest that support, which was resistance at some point, and then you have the permission to rally higher, whether to create another bullish channel or perhaps a last hurrah kind of rally, a spike top. And indeed, Microsoft rallied higher. And then we saw a series of lower highs. That was concerning to begin with. And the chart went down all the way to the channel once again. And now it is facing a sloping line resistance. On top of that, these negative divergences on the RSI and the MACD are extremely concerning. If we get rid of all of these lines and we use the Fibonacci levels, it appears that we have a topping head and shoulder formation, which could take us all the way down another 14% or so before we find a reliable support at around, let's say, 245. But the bottom line is, if Apple is going to go down, if Microsoft is going to go down, then what's left here? Who's going to hold the Nasdaq? Tesla? Is that what you said? Tesla? Here's an hourly chart for Tesla. It lost 9.95 right off the gate. And it didn't even make it above 9.95 throughout the day. And it closed at the lows of the day. Not a good sign for Tesla here. And we have support at the trend line in yellow. If that doesn't work out, we have 8.86 as the next support. Yes, the chart, from a 30 minutes perspective at least, is getting a little oversold. So we could see a rebound and a reattempt to recapture 9.95. But when we zoom out to a daily chart for Tesla, for example, what's going on here? We have a sloping line of resistance, meaning lower highs, combined with a negative channel of lower lows. But then we started to see higher lows. The chart bottomed at around 700 and made a higher low in what it appeared to be a reverse head and shoulder formation. And right away, we saw an impressive rally all the way above 1,000 once again. But this rally's frizzling out now. So what is that range that I'm highlighting here? That is the zone of support, which let's say at around 850 to 950, which I believe that Tesla will eventually move down to and perhaps settle there for a little while. 850 to 950. We have bad news for Tesla, by the way. These Shanghai lockdowns, they're costing the company a lot. In the month of March, Tesla exported only 60 cars. Once again, 60 cars in the Shanghai factory. This is an ominous leading indicator for Tesla's earnings. What about Bitcoin? Tulips, what's going on here? Here comes the failure of 42,000 and we see the flush down right away. We now have negative divergences on both the RSI and the MACD indicator. The only hope left for the bulls is the CPI reading, which I would not place a lot of hope on. But what does the psychology say? When you have Bitcoin breaking out, inviting the buyers, for perhaps a rally all the way to 53,000. And the bulls never showed up. What does that say? The majority of the parties involved in Bitcoin, the pumpers, are holders. Whether they're holding bags or they're holding wins because they bought, let's say, 10,000, 8,000. But where is the new blood? Because in a pyramid scheme, and this is what it really is, Bitcoin is a pyramid scheme, you need new buyers all the time. Because for now, you cannot price Bitcoin based on fundamentals. It can trade at 100,000. It could trade at $1. It all depends if we have new buyers, new demand or not. And for now, it appears, looking at the psychology of the chart, that there is no demand. There is a risk off mode in the market right now, and it means they're not buying Bitcoin. The demand is not here. The chart will go down. And the next support will be at around 35,750. And even Goldman Sachs says that we're seeing the crypto curse, which always happens in the first quarter of the year. But you don't have to listen to me or Goldman Sachs. You can listen to Mama Kathy Wood. Because Mama Kathy Wood still sees Bitcoin heading to $1 million a pop. And rumor has it, Mama Kathy Wood had her last eye exam in 1989. Moving on to AMC, this is a two hours chart. 
AMC's rebounding higher, finally, off oversold readings. Can the apes sustain the rally or not? That's a different story, but it is within the range of possibility that they could run a retest at 21 as resistance by the end of the week. And lastly, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the small business index, most importantly the CPI. The cooks will be busy, busy, busy all morning. And then we have Governor Braindead speaking along with Richmond Tom Barkin. And a reminder, we have earnings coming out of CarMax and Albertsons. And with that, folks, I'm done here. This is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.